I wanted to make this video about uh, the carbon tax in Canada and why it's actually good. Uh, it's, it's more or less a response to Pierre Polyev's Axe the Tax ideology and the Canada sub because I've seen a lot of misinformation online and a lot of people who aren't willing to engage with the more conservative lines of thought regarding the carbon tax. So I was hoping I could clear up some of those misconceptions. The Canada sub has actually become a favorite subreddit of mine, largely because it introduces me to ideas, concepts, and views that you don't necessarily see on all of the other subreddits. So spread it. I like to engage with these kinds of people and see their perspectives. But at the end of the day, there is a reality to climate change. There's a reality to the carbon tax. You might call me a leftist. I prefer to think of myself as a liberal. This post here got a lot of upvotes and, and I think speaks to a lot of the sentiment that many Canadians feel and, and why people are falling in line with the rhetoric that Polyev has around axing the tax. But again, I want to give some perspective here and why the carbon tax is actually good in Canada and good globally. So when we're talking about a carbon tax, we're talking about a tax in general. And I think it's really important that we understand what a tax is and why we would even implement one. Well, the first thing we have to look at, does X cause harm? Where X in this case is carbon tax, but you can replace that with anything, lead or SO2 or NO2 or selenium from a coal mine or anything of the sort that might cause harm. Does X cause harm? If the answer is no, that doesn't cause harm, then you don't really need to implement a tax. But if the answer is yes, then you have to look at whether the market accounts for this harm or not. If the answer to that is yes, then you probably don't need to implement a tax. But if the market doesn't take this into account, and this is what economists typically call an externality. So if that externality isn't accounted for in the market, then you need to apply a tax to, to account for that externality. Again, if there's lead in our pipes, or there's acid rain falling down on you, or we have CFCs in the atmosphere that's causing the ozone uh, to open up and causing people cancer and all of these things, and if that's not accounted for in the market, this is where we deal with that externality. This is like a fundamental principle of capitalism and, and how markets work. Then the way that tax works is that it's passed on to industry. So in the case of the carbon tax, we're looking at uh, increased fees uh, for every ton of CO2 that's emitted, increased fees at the gas pump, things like that. And that tax inevitably gets passed down into transportation and logistics and, and, and things of the matter. And then uh, finally onto the consumer themselves. So yes, the consumer is the one paying for the tax. But the other important aspect of this that we have to ask ourselves is, are there alternatives? If there aren't alternatives, then the tax isn't going to be very effective. But if there are alternatives, like we have here in Canada and the rest of the world, for instance, solar and wind and nuclear power, and carbon capture and storage and, and things like this. These are all alternatives that exist currently and in many cases are actually cheaper than our existing power sources and systems. Without subsidy, solar and wind are actually extremely cheap sources of energy. And then from an individual level, if there's things like public transport, trams, cycle lanes, e-bike subsidies, things like that, then again, you're going to have a more effective use of this, this taxing tool because you have ways to mitigate and eliminate some of the costs that are associated with your carbon emissions. Broadly, all of this kind of combined together produces an incentivized behavior. It incentivizes the use of low carbon emitting, low cost power sources. It incentivizes the use of public transit, uh, walking, uh, densified cities, things that reduce overall carbon emissions. Then when we look at this on an even broader scale, the carbon tax specifically in Canada, the way that it works is 90% of the total tax money goes back to the individual, while the other 10% gets put into uh, subsidies and, and investment into renewable technologies. So when we're actually looking at this, like not only can you calculate uh, the amount of carbon emissions you're expecting to use, you can calculate how much that would cost you on a per year basis on how much the carbon tax is, and then how much you'll um, expect to get back, again, on that 90% uh, cost estimate. So for instance, I live in Alberta with, with my partner, so we get about $1,200 per year back on the carbon tax. So my natural gas bill plus my electricity bill are all going to have carbon taxes associated with it. For me, that's about an extra 10 to $20 a month. And over the course of a year, that's $200 and additionally, I only drive once or twice a week. So that significantly limits the, the effect of the carbon tax. And then you have the carbon tax on your day-to-day -day foods and stuff. But for me, I end up clearing 
probably an extra $800 per year from the carbon tax subsidy because I'm a pretty low carbon emitting person. So to show how the carbon tax does affect our day-to-day life and prices of things, I thought it would be useful to do an example. So I'm going to use peaches from Peachland and peaches from the Central Valley in California, all traveling towards Vancouver, BC, to show approximately how much the cost increase would be due to the carbon tax affecting them. So let's run through the basic assumptions that I'll be using for this example, all in USD. We'll assume a $65 per ton carbon price, about a dollar a kilo for peaches, about 45 cents a kilo for NH3 or ammonia fertilizer or whatnot. Fuel in Canada will be a little bit more expensive at about $1.30 a liter, where the U.S. fuel is about $1 a liter. And then the gas mileage on a big hauling truck will be about 33.6 liters per 100 kilometers or 7 miles to the gallon. And a standard 53-foot truck will hold a volume of 172 meters cubed with a max weight of 20,000 kilos. California's growing time is about twice that of the Okanagan. So to account for that, we assumed that Canada uses about twice the amount of fertilizer as California would. Peaches are about 150 grams with a 7 centimeter diameter, approximately spherical. So I was able to use packing density to see what the max volume filling of the truck would be. Then we have about one and a half kilos of CO2 produced per kilo of ammonia. And about two kilos of fertilizer are required per peach tree from what I could find online. And one peach tree produces between 70 and 120 kilos of fruit per year. When we look at random packing density within a 53 foot truck, we would end up getting about 91,000 kilos of peaches. So that's obviously uh, not what the payload is. So we're gonna go with 20,000 kilos minus about 10% for boxes and other structural things you need to hold the peaches in place while it's transported, which gives us about 18,000 kilos of peaches. When we analyze that, the fuel costs are about $19 per truckload and the ammonia costs are about $49 per truckload extra for the carbon tax which would increase that dollar per kilo peach value uh, by 0.0038 dollars per kilo or about 0.38%. When we do it from California, there's gonna be less fertilizer, but more fuel costs, and that increases the peach cost by 0.005 dollars per kilo or about half a percent. I have all my math here uh, so that it can be checked over if you want to uh, reproduce it for yourself. The next example we're going to look at is the Carlton mushroom example. This is quite topical because it was brought up by Pierre Polyev in the House of Commons. So I think it's important that we look at how much increase to the mushroom cost would actually be. So in the report by the National Post, it said the operating cost increase for him was about 100000 per year. His November gas bill was about 72000 CAD with about 16000 coming from just the carbon tax alone. He said that natural gas or heating broadly was about 10% of his operating costs. And from what I could find online, mushrooms are about $10 a kilo here in Canada. So the total operating cost we're looking at is about 560,000 Canadian per month, and that's excluding the carbon tax. So the carbon tax's impact on his total operating cost is about 3%. After carbon tax rebates though, which is again, 90% of what Canadians would get back on a per capita basis, excluding places like BC, sorry, the total effective cost is going to be closer to about three cents a kilo. What Carlton ended up saying about this, though, is I understand being green and I believe in it, but the cost, the whole extra cost, I can't recapture this. I can't just pass it on to the clients every year, he said. But that's the fundamental purpose of the carbon tax. You do pass it on to the consumer and then the consumer can make choices and decisions in a capitalist market, that is, on what they would like to buy and purchase. And then he can make decisions for himself, whether he needs to move to hydrogen heating, or maybe he needs to move to electrical heating or some other system, or maybe the consumers decide that that cost increase isn't too bad. Again, this is fundamental to how the carbon tax works. Overall, an extra 30 cents per kilo isn't gonna be too bad. And seeing as most people probably are only buying 100 to 200 grams, it's closer to three cents. This is why I have such an issue with Pierre Polyev's axe the tax rhetoric, is that it's a nice slogan, but at the end of the day, it's quite minimal. So an economist at the University of Calgary named Trevor Tomby did an an assessment similar to this, obviously more comprehensive and including a lot more cases, 
he found that the carbon tax was responsible for less than 30 cents on a $100 bill, all things considered. When we're looking at inflation pressures of 3%, upwards of 8% in Canada, and then you have people like Pierre Polyev saying, ax the tax and the carbon tax is increasing inflation. Yes, it does increase inflation, but not nearly as much as other inflationary pressures. These are things like the skyrocketing prices of rent here in Canada, Vancouver specifically in Toronto, or the supply chain issues that we've seen throughout COVID. Again, we can blame the carbon tax for a small amount of inflation, but let's not conflate it with the other problems that are happening in Canada. Getting our housing prices down and subsequently the price that businesses have to pay in order to maintain their their rent on their buildings, that's going to have a dramatic impact on the inflationary pressures we're seeing. Yes, increasing the tax upwards from $65 a ton to $170, or what I advocate for at $250 a ton, that will increase the pressure. That'll change that $0.30 bill to maybe $1.20, $1.50. Again, not negligible, but one and a half percent, not some unfathomable number. And that value only goes down. When we have market competition, when we have solar and wind and nuclear power, being able to replace that of natural gas and coal, again, at cheaper rates, well, then we're going to watch those prices come right down. If you have an issue with the carbon tax, that's fair, but let's not scapegoat it. Then finally, I wanted to discuss some of the broad arguments that I've seen online, particularly in the Canada sub, regarding the carbon tax. Questions that answer who in Canada actually wants a carbon tax. Well, I'll be the first one to put up my hand there. Some of the main arguments are things like Canada is such a small part of the total carbon emissions. So why does anything that we do matter? And why are we the ones being punished when so many other countries are much higher emitters? Other comments include things like, it's just part of a natural cycle. A very interesting comment that I looked into was that Canada has a bunch of trees, so everybody else should be paying us, right? I care about this planet. I care about this world. I care about all the people who will be affected by climate change if we don't do anything. And I want to see that come to fruition. And I want to do that in the most economic way possible. That's why I advocate for a carbon tax so strongly. It's the best solution for us to reduce our carbon emissions and stay economically prosperous. When we're talking about the greater good, the greater good is a carbon tax. That can be clearly shown with systems like En-ROADS, which was developed by MIT. A $250 carbon tax has the potential to reduce global temperatures by 2100 by a full degree, a bigger impact than any other system. This commenter here is correct. If Canada reduced all of our emissions to zero and literally nobody else did it, then yeah, it wouldn't have an impact. But when we look at the G7 countries, we look at the EU, we look at the states, we look at Canada, and if all of those countries and their economic power reduce their carbon emissions in a global initiative like we've had at the Climate Accords and the Kyoto Accords, would you make this argument for any other type of system? I simply believe that carbon is a harm And that externality needs to be accounted for in the market. Look at the example of a coal mine that has selenium running off of it. I don't think anybody would find it acceptable for us to continue drinking this contaminated water. But what if China allows selenium out of their coal mines for their people? Is that really the argument that we want to make? We've been able to deal with disasters like this. CFCs destroying the ozone, lead in our gasoline, SO2 creating acid rain, All of these problems have been fixed by some tax or some government policy of the sort. What we have to understand about the tax is that it's fundamentally libertarian. I can do whatever I want. I just can't cause harm to somebody else. Again, the fundamental libertarian principle. At the end of the day, the carbon tax isn't some net zero game. Canada can lead the world in a positive GDP and environmental impact. Canada has the highest grade nuclear material in the entire world out of Saskatchewan, and we have an abundance of EV minerals and resources. Being leaders in the Green Revolution is going to be an economic boom for Canada, not a burden. Not only that, but we can utilize our fossil fuel industry to help move us towards that. We need a giant hydrogen economy in the next few decades. That can be done extremely efficiently and effectively using natural gas deposits. I don't care if you burn fossil fuels, I care if you release CO2. Again, the benefit of the carbon tax is that if the carbon tax is high enough, 
it's an economic incentive for these natural gas companies to just store their carbon rather than release it. Now let's look at these natural cycle arguments. If humans didn't exist, the climate would change and we would get differences over time. But these are over millennia and centuries and geological scales that humans can barely even comprehend. And then when we have giant and drastic changes in the climate and the CO2 concentration like we do right now, we see massive losses in ecosystems and biodiversity. So when I'm talking about climate change, I'm talking about the last 120 years since the Industrial Revolution that has caused our CO2 emissions to increase from about 280 ppm up to 400 ppm. If we look at a chart from the last 800,000 years on Earth, taken from ice core samples, we see that the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere has been between about 170 and 300 ppm. Furthermore, this is the ideal niche because this is what all of our systems, all of our grain, our rice, our vegetables, our fruits, everything evolved to. These are the conditions that they like. I don't know about you, but I've killed a number of plants in my day. I water them too much, not enough, not enough sunlight, too much sunlight. Now think about that on a global scale, where the things, the plants, the crops that like to live in certain areas now can't. They don't have enough time to evolve at the rate that is required in order to exploit their niche. And even if they do, that process is going to be long and arduous. And the things that do survive are going to take years and years and years to effectively do so. Now, finally, let's look at whether Canada should get a bonus, a carbon credit for the trees that they have. Well, unfortunately, the answer, if we're looking at any time past 2001, is no. If anything, we should have to pay for it. Additionally, sucking up carbon by just planting trees can be an effective solution, but not one when we're still producing tons and tons of CO2 emissions. It's always going to be thermodynamically more advantageous to take CO2 out of the flue stream of a gas plant rather than the really low concentrations that we have in the atmosphere. Low relative to thermodynamics, not low relative to heat increases and the greenhouse effect, obviously. The loss in Canadian forests has largely been driven by things like pine beetle and other insects that kill these trees, and then to some degree forest fires. But insects make up the vast majority and the large reason why Canadian forests are actually net producers of CO2, not absorbers. Here are a few slides on the references that I used to cite this video.